Sankirtana ki jai Shiva Prabhu par ki jai Anta Koti Vaishnavinda Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 Om Jnana Timirandasya Jnana Jnana Shalakaya Chakshurumilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Vayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Svapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Uta Padakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamsha Shri Rupam Sagatatam Sagana Ragunatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadaitam Sadutam Paridana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitam Shram E Krishna Karana Sindhu Dina Bando Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastute Chapta Kancha Gaurangi Radhe Rindavaneshwari Nishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Vevacha Patitana Paulibhyo Vaishna Vebhyo Namo 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 Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Mahade Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Sarasate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvitesha Shunyavadi Pascha Chadesha Tarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadada Shri Vasadi Gaurabhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 we're going to discuss today? Yeah. We're going to discuss some Shikshashtakam. The confidential reasons for the appearance of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And maybe some pastimes. So we'll read from this most glorious, most wonderful scripture. Sri Chaitanya Chaitamrita. So before we read, you can repeat. Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gauda Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gauda Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gauda Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gauda Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gauda Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gauda Bhakta Vrinda so, Krishna's Kaviraj Goswami explains his first verse of this fourth chapter. He says, By the mercy of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, even a foolish child can fully describe the real nature of Lord Krishna. 
the enjoyer of the pastimes of Raja, according to the vision of the revealed scriptures. So it only comes from the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. <clears throat> Without the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, even the most so-called knowledgeable will not even be able to glance at the mercy and nectar of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So, Krishna Skaviraj Goswami is setting our mood. And then he says, All glories to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. All glories to Lord Nityananda. All glories to Sri Advaita Charya. And all glory to all the devotees of Lord Chaitanya. So we pray at the lotus feet of all of the great personalities in our Guru Parampara for their mercy so that we can obtain the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu so that we may understand something about Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu because to understand something about Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the perfection of all that we can know this Chaitanya Charitamrita is considered like the PhD literature we have Bhagavad Gita Srimad Bhagavatam and then Chaitanya Charitamrita it is the supreme nectar Bhagavatam is a ripened fruit of all Vedic knowledge and this Chaitanya Charitamrita is like the nectar of the nectar so sweet it is but it requires mercy to be able to understand so last week we discussed the appearance, the external reasons for the appearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So anybody remember? Why did Chaitanya Mahaprabhu come? What was his mission? To show us how to be a devotee. A devotee of who? Our senses? Krishna. Devotee of Krishna. Yes. And what were some of the things we discussed about the nature of his appearance or what he did, how he performed, what his teachings were. So he was spreading the Yuga Dharma. And the Yuga Dharma is Arinam Sankirtan. The chanting of the holy name. And he was lamenting that, first of all, who is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? He is Lord Krishna himself. He is Krishna himself. We know Krishna comes in many avatars, and sometimes he comes himself. So we know at the end of Dwapar Yuga, Krishna himself appeared in the home, or at least in the prison house of Vasudevji and Devaki, and in the home of Nanda Maharaj and Yashoda Mai. And in his Krishna Leela, he explained and he showed his Rindavan pastimes. Okay? He showed his Rindavan pastimes. And he explained in the Bhagavad Gita how to achieve this highest place of devotion. And what, how do we achieve this highest platform of devotional service? What was the concluding instruction Krishna gave? He said surrender. Right? Sarvar dharmam pritya maam ekam sharnam vrja aham tam sarve papebhyo moksha yishnami masuchaha Srila Prabhupada, in giving a lecture on Gorpunima in Hawaii in 1969, he comments <laughs> in such a forceful way, but a very actual, practical way, that when Krishna says, surrender unto me, we are such rascals that we think, who is this Krishna saying, surrender unto me? We are not willing to surrender. Who is this Krishna saying surrender? That's mighty convenient of him. What's in it for us? 
So, because no one was ready to surrender to Krishna, then Krishna comes Himself. But He comes in a covered mood, covered incarnation, or appearance. Janna. And He says, He'll not explain Himself to be God. He's not going to say, surrender to Me, because the egos of the materialistic person cannot tolerate such a statement, even though it is factually the best for us. Because of our false egos, we cannot accept. So Krishna said, okay, I'll come in the mood of a devotee. And I will show in my activities how to surrender to Krishna. Who is me anyways? But I just won't tell those fools, the rascals, as Prabhupada was complaining, that it is Krishna himself anyways. And we said he was most merciful. Right? Why was he so merciful? How do we see his mercy, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mercy? He was giving the Maha Mantra to each and every person, uh, irrespective of what they would have done in the past. There was no, no qualification needed yeah. to get this benediction. No qualification needed. He was giving it to everyone. How much qualification we need to enter a university? Will it give to anyone? How much qualification we need to rent a simple apartment? Will it give to anybody? How much qualification we need to enter a country? But Krishna, as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, was giving qualification to enter Goloka Rindavan without any prerequisites, no matter how fallen one may be. So His mercy was shown in that He was giving it to everyone. And how else did we see His mercy? How difficult is the process that He gave? Uh, easy process that even a child can do. So it's one thing to give something to everybody, but then if you, the process is so difficult that nobody can take to it, then what is the real mercy? Oh yes, I'm giving everybody a million dollars. It's in this box and you have to guess the combination. You have a one in a billion chance of guessing it. Then am I really being that merciful? But Krishna was giving in the form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu this most valuable gift, perfection of life, to anyone and in a simple process. So we can see that Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was so merciful. So now we, as promised, we said we discussed the confidential reasons that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared. So the external reasons he appeared, that Advaita Acharya was calling to the Lord, worshipping with Tulsi Patra in Ganges water, that Krishna, you please come yourself. I am trying to preach and help people detach from their material allurements. But I cannot. You must, your, only you yourself can do this one. This is too high of a task. Now who is Advaita Acharya? Shiva. And Mahavishnu, Sadashiv. Mahavishnu is lying on an antashesh, creating universes. And he said, Krishna, you must come yourself. So Krishna comes to show the process of devotional service and to give out this Krishna Prema to anyone and everyone through the establishing of the Sankirtana Yajna movement. So that's what we discussed in summary last time. But simultaneously as he was being called, there were some internal emotions that Krishna was feeling that also inspired him to appear. And these, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami explains, is the confidential reasons. He actually says at the end of this chapter, I probably can't find the exact verse in enough time, but I can paraphrase the verse. He says, actually we should not share this. This is too 
confidential. But then he says, well, only those who have the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu can hear it anyways. So then, at least by sharing it, some will become to know this. So you can see the great compassion Krishna's Kaviraj Goswami had by sharing this very nectarian knowledge with us. So I'll read the introduction to this chapter that Srila Prabhupada wrote. And maybe we'll read a few of the verses. But my goal, my hope, is that by just this summary discussion, all of you will be inspired, all of us will be inspired to immediately run, not walk, <laughs> acquire Chaitanya Charitamrita, rip open the box, pull out the first Adi Leela, rip open the covers carefully, <laughs> and open to page 261 and read. And see if we're successful. <laughs> Chapter 4, The Confidential Reasons for the Appearance of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Adi Lila, Chapter 4. Srila Prabhupada's summary is as follows. In this chapter of the epic Chaitanya Chaitamrita, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami has stressed that Lord Chaitanya appeared for three principal purposes of his own. The first was to relish the position of Srimati Radharani who was the prime reciprocator of transcendental love of Lord Krishna. Excuse me, of Sri Krishna. Lord Krishna is the reservoir of transcendental loving transactions with Srimati Radharani. The subject of these loving transactions is the Lord himself, and Radharani is the object. Thus the subject, the Lord, wanted to relish the loving mellow in the position of the object, Radharani. The second reason for his appearance was to understand the transcendental mellow of himself. Lord Krishna is all sweetness. Radharani's attraction for Krishna is sublime. And to experience that attraction and understand the transcendental sweetness of himself, he accepted the mentality of Radharani. The third reason that Lord Chaitanya appeared was to enjoy the bliss tasted by Radharani. The Lord thought that undoubtedly Radharani enjoyed his company and he enjoyed the company of Radharani. But the exchange of transcendental mellow between the spiritual couple was more pleasing to Radharani than to Sri Krishna. Radharani felt more transcendental pleasure in the company of Krishna than he could understand without taking her position. But for Sri Krishna to enjoy in the position of Srimati Radharani was impossible because that position was completely foreign to him. Krishna is the transcendental male and Radharani is a transcendental female. Therefore, to know the transcendental pleasures of loving Krishna, Lord Krishna himself appeared as Lord Chaitanya, accepting the emotions and bodily luster of Srimati Radharani. Lord Chaitanya appeared in order to fulfill these confidential desires and also to preach the significance of chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, and to answer the call of Advaita Prabhu. These were the secondary reasons. Sri Sarup Dhamadar Goswami was the principal figure among Lord Chaitanya's confidential devotees. The records of his diary have revealed these confidential purposes of the Lord. These revelations have been confirmed by the statements of Srila Rupa Goswami in his various prayers and poems. This chapter also specifically describes the difference between lust and love. The transactions between Krishna and Radha are completely different from material lust. Therefore, the author has very clearly distinguished between them. There were three reasons that Krishna came in the mood of, what did he come in the mood of? And thus, he assumes a golden complexion. Because Srimati Radharani's complexion is golden. So that's what we call Gauranga. He is the golden avatar. 
So there are three reasons he comes. Now, before we discuss those three reasons, we have to rewind back a little bit and go, take a little bit of a technical detour and build a little foundation for understanding this relationship between Krishna and his most beloved Srimati Radharani. Because this topic is not one we can understand actually without the mercy and without the prayers of our Guru Parampara. Because immediately our mind goes to a very mundane place. Because that is what we experience when we when we see interactions between male and female, we understand it in the context of lust. And thus, Krishna's Kaviraj Goswami spends a significant amount of time in this chapter distinguishing between the two. So, we won't go into so much detail on that because we cannot give it adequate uh, substance, but you can read on your own. But, we have to go back now to Krishna Lila. When Krishna came, he performed many, many pastimes. Right? We see in the tenth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. He performed pastimes in Vraj. He performed pastimes in Mathura. And he performed pastimes in Dwarka. Dwarka. So we have, and then of course in and around different areas, different pastimes. But these are the main three center points of his pastimes. And in the spiritual world, we see there are these lokas also. In the spiritual world, there is Dwarka, there is Mathura, and there is Vrindavan, Raj, which we know as Goloka Vrindavan. So, these the pastimes in each of these different areas have different moods, different emotions, and different activities. And Srila Prabhupada is commenting in the purports here that when Krishna came at the end of Dwapar Yuga, all of the different features of Krishna also came. All the forms of Lord Vishnu, all the different avatars, they all manifested in Krishna. And thus he appeared. So he was in some way, we can say, the all-in-one. He is the fountainhead, the source of all avatars. And so when he came, he came with all of them. And Krishna himself had one desire, and that was to enjoy with his devotees, his Vrindavan pastimes, his Raja pastimes. He did not have to come to destroy any demons. That he could have sent anybody. Right? He could send any personality, any one of his avatars, or even some empowered person to destroy the demons. He did not have to come personally to establish the principles of religion. He could have sent one of his great representatives. But what he came was to experience the sweetest pastimes and to show all of us those pastimes. Because he could have experienced them in the spiritual world also. There is Rindavan there also. But he came specifically to the material world to show all of us and what is the significance of these Rindavan pastimes? What distinguishes them from the other pastimes? So, let's explain that when Krishna is killing the demons, it is actually not Krishna who is killing. It is Lord Vishnu who comes out and performs those pastimes. When Akrura came to take Krishna to Mathura, Actually, Krishna never left. Vasudev Krishna continued on. But Krishna himself entered into the hearts of all of the residents of Vrindavan. He never left Vrindavan. This Srila Prabhupada explains in the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. 
And from there, all the other pastimes were performed by Vasudev Krishna. So why Krishna stayed back? What is so significant about those pastimes? So, Lord Krishna says, All the universe is filled with the conception of my majesty. But love, weakened by that sense of majesty, does not satisfy me. If one regards me as the Supreme Lord and himself as subordinate, I do not become subservient to his love, nor can it control me. And then he says, In whatever transcendental mellow my devotee worships me, I reciprocate with him. That is my natural behavior. So Krishna is saying, which relationships please Krishna the most? It is what? Gopis. But which, what weakens the love between that Krishna, the experience Krishna feels when something is present? No, weakens. His majesty. His awe and reverence. Grand opulence. He says, if one regards me as the Supreme Lord and himself as subordinate, I do not become subservient to that love. Now this is very difficult for us to understand. We are saying, I am part and parcel of Krishna. I am eternal servitor. Right? But Krishna enjoys when those devotees engage with Krishna without awe and reverence, in pure love, informally. So, we give the example of the Supreme Court judge. The Supreme Court judge interacts with people in the courtroom in a very formal manner. Sits on a high bench, grand robes, very formal way of interacting. That reciprocation, that exchange is pleasing. But what is more pleasing to that same judge is when he goes home, he's casually joking with his friends, enjoying with his spouse, playing with his children. Those, that gives most, those ex exchanges give most pleasure. Right? So Krishna is at the same mood. When he is worshipped with awe and reverence, he is pleased, no doubt. But what gives him the most pleasure is when he is worshipped in a very informal way. So how this happens? So Krishna's Kabiraj Goswami is, going, is explaining in this chapter, again I apologize, we're a little bit technical, but it's important to set this foundation to understand these reasons. So, the purity of one's devotee, see the, the, the irony of devotional service is this. Krishna says, surrender everything to me. Right? He says, surrender everything to me. Now, we are so rascals, or at least myself, I'm thinking, why is Krishna telling you surrender? And that's not, no. My ego subjects that, right? But, Krishna says, I do not become subservient to his love. But when one surrenders everything to Krishna, Krishna surrenders everything to him or her. That doesn't register with us. Because when I surrender to my boss in the office, he doesn't surrender everything back, the profits of the company to me. He, he gives me the absolute minimum to get me to come back tomorrow. That's our material understanding. But Krishna, when we surrender to Krishna, he, what gives him most pleasure is surrendering everything back to his devotee. Krishna surrendered his position as Supreme Lord and took the position of the driver. For Arjuna. So, our mission 
is to surrender to Krishna. And when Krishna sees this pure love, he gives everything back. Actually, Krishna tells us all along, be detached from your work. We were discussing yesterday. But Krishna himself is also detached. Nothing he is telling us in Bhagavad Gita, he himself does not do. So, when one fully surrenders to Krishna, one actually obtains everything back. But the motive to surrender is not to obtain anything back. That is the purity. Otherwise, now I'm in a business transaction. I will surrender, so I get. That's not pure. And we're going to see this mood from Srimati Radharani in a little bit. So this in Rindavan, what we call the Ragatmika Bhaktas, they have an intense attachment to serving Krishna. They only know serving Krishna. But they're not serving Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They're not serving Him because He is God. They are simply serving because He's Krishna. He's so sweet, so attractive. There is no motive. And how that happens, Krishna Kaviraj explains, that Krishna's yoga maya potency, the illusory energy, they cover the understanding of Krishna's devotees. Because if they, if they know Krishna's Supreme Lord, all they'll do is bow. But Krishna's not so... Please, he wants that joking relationship. He wants the chastising relationship. He wants Mother Yashoda to chase him with a stick when he broke the butter pot. Well, how she could do if she thought she was chasing the Supreme Lord? So, Yoga Maya covers. But deep down, they always know. But their consciousness becomes of this. And in this way, Krishna and his devotees interact in the purest form. It's the purest relationship. right? In the courtroom, the relationships that exist there are somewhat structured. They're based on that circumstance. But the pure relationships that judge has is in his personal dealings. So these personal dealings take place in Vrindavan. And there are four types of personal relationships one can have. One of a servant, one of a friend, one of a parent, and one of a lover. Dasya, Sakya, Vatsalya, Madhurya. These four rasas, they exist only in Goloka Vrindavan. And this intensity of love is the highest of all love. And we can see the love or the respect, the love one has for the judge in the courtroom, how it compares to the love between the, his child and the judge, or between the spouse, or between the friends. It's of a different nature. So Krishna is at home in Vrindavan. So these pastimes are the ultimate relationship one can achieve with the Supreme Lord. And they give Krishna the highest happiness in service. And that is what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is giving us. Not just entry to the spiritual world, but to the ultimate realm. There's much variety in the spiritual world. And that he was giving with this simple process. So, this now in the nectar of devotion, Srila Rupa Goswami explains how to achieve this. And he explains that now that this is the form, this is the knowledge we have, shall we worship Krishna in this very intimate, informal way? Can we do so? We cannot. We are not pure. We are not purified in the heart. If we have the opportunity to interact with Krishna this way, we'll be confused. We'll begin to think, oh, maybe I am supreme. I am Krishna is carrying me home 
after I won the match, maybe I am stronger than Krishna. These thoughts will start to manifest because we are not pure in the heart. So Rupa Goswami says that we start with our Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti. Means we begin to perform devotional service under guidance of Guru and Scripture. The impetus to do is there. But we are hoping through purifying to come to, he explains, this Raganuga, which means spontaneous. I'm chanting my rounds not because I have to, as I want to. It's so sweet. So much pleasure is there. There's an internal impetus. In Vaidhisa, there's an external. Again, I apologize. A little bit technical, but I'm trying to explain that we have to go to this spontaneous mood. Because who are the perfected devotees who, who serve Krishna spontaneously? Gopis. All the Rindavan devotees, including the Gopis. But all of the Rindavan devotees they have perfected this service in spontaneous love. They don't study scriptures to see how to serve Krishna. They are following their heart. But in order to follow one's heart, as Mataji said, the heart first must be pure. Otherwise, it may go in all kinds of directions. So how to purify the heart? We purify the heart through the Vaidhi Bhakti principles. The regulated principle. But the regulated principles, if we understand the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, are to bring us to this spontaneous love. So while we are performing our regulated processes, we should not become blind to the goal, which is to obtain this spontaneous love. We are not ready for it, and we cannot pretend and be a pretender and they go, oh yes, I am a spontaneously attached. No. We must stick very steadfast to our regulated process of devotional service. Rupa Goswami and Prabhupada explained that one should never give up the regular, even if one has achieved the spontaneous love, one should maintain their Vaidhi principles. So, but the goal of our regulated practice is to develop this internal motivation to serve. Right now it's somewhat external. I understand. I have faith in Guru and scriptures, so I'm following. And our goal is by following, we'll purify, the heart will become free of anarthas, mostly free of anarthas, and we will come to be able to then spontaneously serve. And this is the path that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has provided. Now what scope we had to even have any of this knowledge were not for the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. We see in spiritual practitioner very little knowledge is known about these different realms within the spiritual world and where the highest love exists. But we know very logically it must be in Rindavan. So that is what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gave. So our goal is to experience that. And Srila Prabhupada established actually our worship of the deities in the temples in the mood of Lakshmi Narayan. Now many of you may be surprised to hear that. Why he did that? Because this, this awe and reverence will make, keep us disciplined to practice and purify, and we will not be tempted to come to prematurely some of the more intimate relationships. Because we'll mess it up if we're not pure. We'll not understand how Krishna is eating foodstuffs from the plates of his coward boys. And we'll think, oh yeah, I can eat just from Krishna's plate. He was doing in Vrindavan. Must be okay. In this way, we'll not. So he established that we worship. But for the mood of purifying, without losing sight of the goal of entering these Rajalila pastimes. So, that is a long introduction to now these confidential reasons. But it's important to understand where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is giving us access to. Then we can appreciate His mercy. Because remember, this 
He is giving with the simple process of chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. No intense austerity, no vast knowledge of scripture required, no vast amounts of time to perform various yagyas and sacrifices. No. The keys are right within our hands and it is in our bead bag. That is what we can, and we should establish that as the goal as we are chanting. Our goal shall be how we can purify to the point where we may also engage with Krishna in this way. So now to the confidential reasons. And we'll see how sweet this relationship is. So Krishna we know is all-knowing, right? He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. And he's all-loving. So his omniscient potency means he knows everything. He is the supreme creator, the source of everything. He is Atma Rama. It means he is fully self-satisfied. There's nothing that we can give Krishna that will satisfy him because whatever we give him, he created anyways. So if you are the unlimited creator, whatever he's lacking, he can just create and be satisfied. Right? The definition of not being satisfied is we're missing something. Right? If I have everything I want, then by definition I'll be satisfied. So what is it that, that we can then satisfy the Lord with? He has everything. He has one thing that he longs for. That is the love. He wants love. When we offer him chapatis, he is not looking to fill his belly with our chapatis. He is looking to fill his heart with the love that went into making the chapatis. That is what he's looking for. Everything else he has. He's the almighty, all potent creator. Om Purnam Adaha Purnam. He's complete. Even though he's complete making so many things, he's always complete. He's never lacking anything. Om Purnam Eva Vishishite. He creates so many universes, but still his storehouse is full. But love is what he is looking for. And how powerful is this love, this pure love? Pure love means, and we'll describe how this love is, but pure love means no personal motive. The relationship between man and woman in the material world is one of what we call lust, because there's personal desires. But pure love, there is no bent scope for one's own advancement, one's own happiness. So, Krishna says, I can't understand one thing. This is the omniscient, all-knowing, supreme intelligent person. He is the possessor of all intelligence, right? The six opulences, strength, wealth, fame, beauty, intelligence, renunciation. Intelligence. He has all intelligence. But there's something he doesn't quite understand. And that is what it is like to be in the, wearing the shoes, figuratively, being from the perspective of his purest of devotee. He doesn't contemplate, he cannot contemplate how this person who's giving him so much happiness, how that person can give herself so completely to him. This abode of such happiness for him, he cannot understand her position. The all intelligent. This is how potent bhakti is. So he wants to experience that position from Srimati Radharani. He cannot understand how Srimati Radharani can be so attracted to him. Meaning, what is so sweet that she is willing to forego religious principles, society principles, she's willing to forego her own comforts, anything she's willing to give up for him. 
and he's trying to figure out what is so sweet. This was the second reason. What is so sweet about me? Once when he was in Dwarka, he was passing and he passed one fountain. He was in one of his palaces and he saw his reflection and he was struck. He said, who is this? And he was struck by his beauty. So stunningly beautiful is Krishna that you cannot drink the end of his beauty. Meaning the more you see, the more you want to see more. It, you can never get to the end of his beauty. So beautiful. And thus he's all attractive. But he's like, what is this taste, this mellow that one experiences? He could not understand that. So he wanted to come. And then he wanted to experience the transcendental bliss. And Krishna's Kaviraj Goswami explains that whatever happiness he gets from the service of his devotee, his devotee gets more happiness. And he says, how is that possible? I am the source of everything. How the source can have less than the dependent? How it's possible? When Radharani becomes happy, he becomes happy seeing her. And his happiness grows. But then when his happiness grows, Srimati Radharani seeing Krishna happy goes thousand times higher. Krishna's Kaviraj Goswami is explaining. And there's a no one is defeated. But Krishna never wins. And he thinks, I want to experience this kind of happiness. And what kind of mood Srimati Radharani has and these pure devotees of Vrindavan have in their service? They are not serving Krishna to enjoy. When one has no desire to enjoy, but just the enjoy, desire to serve is explained. This happiness is forced upon them. Srimati Radharani, when she obtains the ecstatic symptom of freezing up and her limbs are shaking, and the gopis, not Srimati Radharani exactly, but the gopis, their limbs are shaking, they are upset. <laughs> we are waiting for that ecstasy to happen. Are we not? But they're upset. Why? Because that shaking of the limbs is interfering with their service to Krishna. And thus they feel Krishna's happiness is now reduced. When the eyes are watering, we are praying, when my eyes We'll, be, we'll chant in the Shikshtashtakam prayers. Tears will flow like torrents of rain. But they are trying to push them back in. Why? Because it's blurring their vision. Anybody who's cried knows we cannot see straight. And then their service is becoming disrupted. So they are trying to suppress their own happiness. So that they can enhance Krishna's happiness. When one has this kind of purity, that one even suppresses one's own happiness to please Krishna. Krishna becomes so ecstatic by that pure love, he completely gives himself to them. He becomes subservient to that love. And that happiness is forced upon that servant. So in our initial practice of devotional service, we come to bhakti, we want to be free from birth, death, old age, disease, adhyatmika, dibhautika, dibhavi. This is the initial catalyst. But as we purify, our desires will purify, should purify, to the point that our only desire is to see Krishna happy. Even if our own devastation. The gopi's mood is so pure 
that if their devastation gives happiness to Krishna, they do not think, Krishna, how you can be so evil that my devastation gives you happiness? What they pray for? Devastate me. <laughs> oh Krishna, if that is going to give you happiness, smash me. That's how much faith they have. Now, does Krishna smash them? Of course not. But they're willing, truly, not just saying it, but truly willing and eager when Krishna had a headache. And he told Narada Muni, I need dust from the feet of my devotee to cure my headache. <coughs> Narada Muni went to some great brahmanas and said, Krishna is not feeling well, he needs dust. Are you crazy? We'll go to hell if I give dust from my feet and put on the Lord's head. You think we are silly? That's why we are studying. And he went to so many different personalities, great, great personality. Nobody would give. Nobody would be so foolish to give dust from their feet to put on Krishna's head. No one is that silly. So Narada Muni went back. He said, Krishna, no one in this universe is so silly. Yes, there are some fallen people, but not that fallen. And he said, have you approached my most beloveds? No, they won't give for sure. They're, you've told me so much of their glories. They, of course, would not give. He said, go ask them. And Narada Muni goes, and he asks to go, how is Krishna? Oh, he has headache. He has headache. Their hearts were shattered, having the pain, hearing the pain of Krishna. How can we help? They need dust from your, the lotus feet of his devotee. Before he could even finish the sentence, they had started making mountains and mountains of dust from their feet. Narada Muni is perplexed. You're really willing to give the dust from your feet? Do you know? Do you know anything? You'll suffer in hell. And their response? That suffering in hell will be our greatest pleasure if Krishna is relieved from his headache. If Krishna gets relief from his headache, then whatever happens to us, no problem. That will be our greatest happiness. So this is the purity of love. And this is the purity of love that will develop in each and every one of us if we follow the practices Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had lined up. He was not giving this just to the select few. He was giving this purity of love. It almost seems unreachable for us. But that is what he was giving with this simplest of process. But we must do it sincerely. And he instructed Rupa Goswami, who then wrote the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, and gave the step-by-step -step process of how one can begin in this Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti, following the 64 Angas, under the guidance of Guru and Scripture, practicing devotional service, to come to this mood of spontaneous practice, this Raganuga, and then from there coming to Bhava Bhakti, and ultimately to this pure Krishna Prema. So this is what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came and he himself cannot fully understand the absolute nature of this love. And that's the confidential reason why he came. He came to experience the position of this pure devotee. He came to experience the sweetness that the devotee tastes just like if Prabhuji is eating rasgulla and he's saying it's so sweet, I'm thinking, I want to taste rasgulla. Yeah. He explains it to me. It says this texture, this sugar syrup. This. I, I want to taste it myself. Like this, Krishna could not understand. And you may have seen the one picture of Krishna sucking on his toe. You've seen him sitting mm -hmm. on the banyan leaf. Mm -hmm. yeah. He is tasting the nectar mm -hmm. that is devotee. He's thinking, what is so sweet about my lotus feet? Let me taste. And he begins to suck. That's that pastime. And three, 
that transcendental bliss his pure devotees experience far exceeds what Krishna himself, who is Om Purnam, he's complete, experiences. This is the inconceivable nature of the love between Krishna and his pure devotees. So, when we are faced with this, we have so many impurities, at least speaking of myself only. So how will we ever overcome them? It's seemingly hopeless. But it's not. Because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, being so merciful, said, just chant the holy names of the Lord. And you will achieve that same. He was opening the doors to these Rindavan pastimes for all of his followers. So that's what awaits us when we follow the instructions of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Srila Prabhupada came to the West to propagate this message of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And thus we are extraordinarily fortunate to have come in contact with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings. Because his teachings are very confidential. They're not so well known. But they are becoming more and more broadcast in time. So, this is... We went very long, I'm sorry. But, in... I'll finish with one quick discussion now of Shikshtashta compares. That Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, his whole mission was to teach us this specific step-by-step -step path to achieve this highest realm of bhakti. And he gave us eight verses in the Shikshtashtakam. He, he left no other verses. He gave us eight verses. And these verses take us from the initial entry point of chanting the holy names to this pure love of Godhead. So, we chant the Shikshtashtakam prayers for understanding and accessing the potency of the holy names. And that's why every day we should chant and recite these prayers. So we'll discuss them <laughs> maybe next week, the more purport of them, just because it's getting late. And we can maybe recite them a little bit later today also. So any questions or comments? When you say confidential, what do you mean by confidential? Or was it only nice. maybe to a select few? Uh, that's a very nice question. So what is the meaning when we say confidential? Is it meaning it's only privy to a select few? We see, what is the title of the ninth chapter of Bhagavad Gita? Most confidential knowledge. We see this is the confidential pastimes. So what is the meaning of confidential? Does it mean that we should not be talking about it? We should not be broadcasting it then. Exactly. If somebody tells me a confidential secret, I'm taking a vow not to tell. Right? So, confidential means that, one, it is of high value, first of all. Right? Anything confidential we know is of extraordinary value. But in this sense, confidential means not widely understood. But not that it should not be widely understood. So, when we speak about these pastimes, we did not go into so much detail, because we should not, nor are we able to, but when we speak about these loving pastimes of Krishna, we cannot understand them. We should not discuss them, because our minds aren't capable of processing them. So in that way, they're kept a little bit more reserved. But, our mission, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, went all over India preaching this philosophy. He was trying to make it unconfidential. Meaning he was propagating this philosophy to everyone. And then he made the prediction that in every town and village the holy names would be sung. Not every town and village of India. Every town and village of the world. Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, Soon in Mayapur Dam, 
There will be people from Asia and Europe and America all over chanting in the streets. And people thought, you're crazy. And just a few weeks ago, they had the Gaur Purnima Navadri Mandal Parikrama. And there was a whole group just from China. So big they made a separate Chinese group. There's a separate Russian group. An English speaking group. Hindi. Bengali. All over the world. People are walking through the streets of Navadweep. Chanting the holy name. Because Krishna himself said it, it's factually going to happen. So these pastimes, are, if, if everyone participates in this Sankirtan army, will not remain confidential. Our mission is to try to bring them to anyone and everyone who desires to understand them. And this TOVP project is one big opportunity to bring understanding of who is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. How many of us had heard of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu before coming in contact with Srila Prabhupada's teachings? Maybe we heard of him as some great devotee. Right? Because that's how he presented himself. But how many of us understood what his true mission was? Who he was? The confidential reasons he came. So Srila Prabhupada endeavored extraordinarily hard to make these accessible to all of us. So confidential refers to something of great importance but not necessarily widely known. And our hope is that we will slowly participate in making this more accessible to anyone who has desired. Sometimes we undervalue the significance of what is in front of us. You know, familiarity breeds contempt. It's right in front of us, so we sometimes underappreciate the significance of it. It's right in our hands. Prabhupada's scriptures are here. Guru is waiting to take us to this process. But, it's so significant. Any other comments or questions? Yes, One second. What did the other question was? Yeah. So the Vaidhi Sadhana principles, um, remember, we're, we're practicing chanting of the holy names. Reading and discussing and remembering Krishna's names, pastimes, forms, singing his glories, taking prasadam. These are all the activities, right? But why we do them? Because we're following some regulation. It's not yet naturally internally inclined. We do the same activities. Chanting japa, reading, associating, prasadam. Same activity. But the, the motivation is out of our own desire. We don't chant 16 rounds, we chant hundreds of rounds. Whatever moment we have, we chant. Right now we have maximum 16, but actually it's minimum 16. <laughs> So that minimum comes when we have a natural inclination. So how to have that natural inclination? We have to purify the heart. Well, what will purify the heart? <coughs> this Vaidhi principle. So the link is the practice of Vaidhi, but Rupa Goswami explains in Nectar Devotion that two things are required. Loba and you remember the other one? Huh? Determination, greed, determination, and humility. When one in intensely desires, let me have a spontaneous taste of these holy names, Krishna. I know they're so sweet, but I'm not tasting it. 
this tongue is not so pure. Please, please, please give me. I cannot obtain it on my own. The humility comes. I cannot do it on my own. No matter how perfectly I try to chant, no matter how perfectly I try to follow the principles, it cannot be accomplished without your mercy. That requires humility. So intense desire, almost to the point of demanding, Rupa Goswami explains, you must give it to me. But I need it. That greed, that intensity, how a child tells mother, you must give me that candy. In that way, did we chant our rounds this morning that way? <laughs> Saying, Krishna, you must please give me this love of God. So we have to approach our Vaidhi principles with this intense desire and utmost humility. Actually, the core ingredient of Krishna Prema is humility. It means humility, actually. That's explained in another scripture. So, because the humility comes that it can only come from Krishna. Only Krishna can bestow it upon us. We cannot do it. We can never do it. So only Krishna can bestow it upon us if he sees. Because remember, he's not going to give himself up to anyone. He's only going to give to someone he, that is pure in intention. Will you give the keys to your house to anyone? Only if you know that their intentions are pure, then you'll give easily. No reservations. But if you have, so if our heart is impure, Krishna will wait. But if we have strong enough desire and a humble position, then that spontaneous attraction will manifest. And so, but if we don't have that as the goal, then we'll become just mechanical in our vaidhi, which is good. But the better option is to have a goal in mind. And this nectar devotion helps us to clarify what is it I'm trying to achieve with my chanting? What is my ultimate goal? Right? Just like when I go into college, I know my goal is to graduate. So all the steps of the intense study, the hours of different classes I'm taking, and all the pay, I know the end goal is to graduate. What is the end goal of my Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti? To purify the heart so that this spontaneous love that we see amongst the Ragatmika Bhaktas. And thus, how we practice Raghunaga Bhakti is also given. We begin to meditate on particular passages. It's a long discussion uh, from Nectar of Devotion. But we all can read Nectar of Devotion as well. It's a very nice scripture. So, it's okay? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. with a question like... Uh, by this Sadhana Bhakti to the Raghunaga Bhakti, like it's a, it's kind of a jump or like if there is any other steps we need to follow, like no. It, it's that's the next step. That's the next step. So can you question like uh, we have uh, like Dwarata and like Kingdom and Matuva in that spiritual, but how the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared and um, Mayapur, I, you know, he's not appeared in Vrindavan or Madhura. I just want to understand that Mayapur. Yeah, because Mayapur Sri Navadvip Mandal also exists in the spiritual world. There's a whole detailed explanation of the nine islands mm -hmm. that exist in Goloka Vrindavan. So, Gora Lila also takes place in the spiritual world. So, there's no difference between Navadvip Mandal and Vajmanda. Within Navadip you'll find Kurukshetra also, you'll find uh, Radhakun, Shamkun, you'll find Gopal, you'll find all the different spiritual places are all within Navadip also. They're non different. Um, yeah, yeah, here in Mayapur. And if you go to Mayapur, you do Navadip Mandal Parikrama, you'll see all these places. You'll take darshan. And in our mind we may concoct differences. But there is no difference. Just like in my mind, I concoct the difference that when I say Krishna and the person Krishna are different. But there is no difference between Krishna and his names. But we don't perceive it. But in Navadvip Mandal, all these holy places are there. 
Everyone. How would that be so? Like I know. Uh, because when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared, they all appeared. They all appeared. Yeah. One second, you have the second question? Yes. Then you can ask after, if you want. Hi, this is Amma. Yeah, Mataji. Um, I was just by, out of curiosity, when you said that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he had come, one of the confidential reasons was that um, to taste the love that uh, Radharani was experiencing. So once he came over here, he experienced that, did he express any kind of a reaction? How did he express? I mean, I don't know. Because it was never... You are just like giving me the high pitch that I can just uh, <laughs> go by Chaitanya Charitamrita. And you read Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami. So in the life, the appearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, 48 years he appeared, 24 years he was in Navadvip, and then he took sannyas. The last 24 years, the first six of those, he did lots of traveling and different pastimes. In the final section of his Leela, he went into virtual seclusion. And he stayed at Gambira. And his close associates, particularly Swarup Damodar and Ramananda Rai, they were with Krishna or Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Swarup Damodar kept a diary of all the things that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was doing. And these are some of the most incredible when you read how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was experiencing the separation, specific bhav was one of separation from Krishna. So the most intense love of Krishna is separation, which is again counterintuitive. We think, I want to be with Krishna. But when Krishna really sees our love, he disappears. Why? Because it intensifies, it rages so strong. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu goes through so many ecstatic experiences, experiencing and relishing this deepest, deepest mood of separation from Krishna. And he goes, from an external we think madman. He is in the middle of the night running. They had to lock the doors in his room so he would not escape. Because sometimes he would leave searching for Krishna. He would climb some hill thinking it was Govardhan. He would jump into the ocean thinking it was a Yamuna. Um, and he, was, he would perform so many, very exciting, all of it in detail is described, in particular in Antilila uh, of Chaitanya Charitamrita. Very, very sweet to see um, and, and read. So, yeah, it, what he experienced is given, and you'll see the extreme ecstatic emotions that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was experiencing. And he was relishing that taste, that love, that Shrimati Radharani was having uh, for him. So it's, we are fortunate that those diaries were kept and Krishna's Kaviraj Goswami documented it and now we have it in Chaitanya Chaitanya. All of the uh, cantos are from the diary? Many of them. Many of the, not all of them because some of the initial pastimes Sarup Damodar came to Jagannath Puri after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had already reached Jagannath Puri. So he wrote from past uh, diaries of Sarup Damodar, of Raghunath Das Goswami, and what he heard from the other senior associates. And then from that he, he wrote, he said, I am not writing. Actually, Krishna himself is writing. And I am, uh, uh, Jagaguru Prabhu was mentioning as well, at the end, Krishna Kaviraj Goswami considers himself a wooden doll. And someone is moving his hand to write that. A wooden doll cannot move. And he says, That's, I'm just. There are three main literatures on Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Chaitanya Mangal, Chaitanya Bhagavat, and Chaitanya Chaitamrita. Written by Rindavan Das Thakur, Lotan Das Thakur, <coughs> and Krishna Kaviraj Goswami. So they cover pretty much the whole. Chaitanya Bhagavat covers more predominantly the early pastimes. Chaitanya Charitamrita more the secondary pastimes, this from 24 to 48. There's some overlap in both. And that way. So the Mahaprakash Leela happened in the... In the beginning. So that's more you'll see in Chaitanya Bhagavat. You won't see in Chaitanya Charitamrita. 
reference is there. But so what happened immediately after he uh, took Sannyasa? Uh, no, before he took Sannyasa. Before. Before. Because that happened in Srivas Thakur's house. From taking sannyas, he did not go back to Navadip, he went to Shantipur. So it took place before. But during that time, after Lord Nit Lord Nityananda came from 20, so t between 20 and 24 is when that Mahaprakash really took place. And then at 24 is when he took sannyas. I have a question. You were mentioning, you were mentioning that uh, he had obviously not so pure enough to uh, love uh, Krishna in an informal way to uh, so be kind of uh, do it as we are as servitors right but um, um, just wondering uh, is that the um, what should be the mode when we are worshipping because many of the devotees also I see that uh, they, some of them you know they uh, relate to Krishna as uh, he is a baby some of them relate to <coughs> time so um, when you are uh, relating to Krishna when, as a baby, then you will obviously get the tendency to uh, have a motherly uh, feelings. Yeah. But we are not pure enough. So, it's a kind of contradiction. Yeah. I can speak exactly how is prescribed in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. And it may slightly contradict with what is, you know, others believe. So, but I can, I'll just speak at least what's in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Which is that one should always perform their Vaidhi principles, <coughs> even if one has reached the spontaneous mood, this, the purification. So externally, they perform their Vaidhi principles, meaning they're chanting. We cannot see who is it. We, we, we should not even try to judge because we'll be bewildered. It has nothing to do with the dress, nothing to do with the way they dance in kirtan, nothing to do with how they make offerings for the Lord, nothing to do with how they dress the Lord. That has nothing to do with it. Nothing we can see. It comes from here. So we should not judge because you'll guaranteed make a wrong conclusion one way or the other. Either you'll underestimate somebody or overestimate somebody. So better, assume they are all pure devotees. Mm -hmm. That is the mood of a devotee. So, but as we progress, we may internally meditate on, you know, certain pastimes that are very attractive to us. And as we begin to read and study more, certain things will become more attractive. So those things we can meditate on. But if we begin to broadcast that, what happens? We become proud. And immediately everything is squashed, done, gone. What is pride? It is like you you prepare a wonderful dish. You put all the perfectly homegrown vegetables in it. You cook it perfectly, spice it perfectly. Just everything is ready. And then you just dump extra five tablespoons of salt in the dish. Everything is ruined. That is our pride. It will ruin everything. Whatever we've worked so hard for. Mm -hmm. So we externally and even internally, one thinks themselves to be the most fallen. The Mahabhagavat, the highest caliber devotee, they see that everyone around them is more advanced than them. And thus, they actually can't even preach. Because they think, I don't know as much. They're actually the highest devotees. But their mood is that, oh, I see spirit soul, spirit soul, spirit soul, tree spirit soul. They are so beautiful. I am fallen. And if that's the mood of the purest devotee. Now our mood to them, should I, yeah, you are fallen. <laughs> no, our mood is you are the wonderful devotee. Right, so... Um, our own practices, we have to be very careful that we don't begin to slacken our regulated principles. Because if we do, we will pre Narottam Das Thakur. So he is an eternal associate of Champakvata, Sakhi, one of the 
Principal Suckies. And his past, his eternal service in Goloka was revealed to him. That he was boiling the milk that Champakot the Saki would use to make the various milk sweets that Krishna would enjoy during his various pastimes. So that his service was boiling the milk. So while he was chanting his japa, he would be internally meditating so intensely on this service that his hand was burned. So he was walking around and he has covered his hand. He was not saying, look, look, look what happened to me. I am eternal. He was like this. And Jiva Goswami asked, what are you doing? And he looked up and he saw and he understood that what was happening. But Narottam Das Thakur's approach was correct. We don't reveal nor are we qualified to even understand. So in the prior generations, the spiritual masters used to reveal the disciples' eternal service. But Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur stopped that practice <coughs> because people were not responsible with that information. Oh, I am this, you are that. All of a sudden, material world creeps in. We cannot handle that. So, better we stay in our Vaidhi Sadhana principles with the goal of always evoking the... But the, remember, the practice doesn't change. In spontaneous love doesn't mean that we just go around and... No. We still chant our japa, we still read, we still do the same practices. But the motivation becomes more spontaneous. And you'll have moments of, oh, I really want to get up and chant today. Right? And you have other moments where oh, I don't want to, but I made a vow I will, I'll do it. We'll have those. Right? Those are like, we get some tinges of that spontaneous thing. It's okay? Both. He was a Grahastha Ashram for 24 years, or I mean up to 24, and then... <coughs> And then he had took then he took sannyas. So and his wife's name was? You should know best. <laughs> oh, so like oh okay, so that's the okay. Eternal consorts. These are not these are not dating relationships. These are eternal consorts. And who is Radharani? Radharani is Krishna's internal energy. Where Krishna Kaviraj Goswami says, it is one manifested in two persons. Meaning it's Krishna's internal energy exhibited in a person. So when they love each other, it's not like what we see. Boy, girl, meet on a bus stop. No. This is the same coffee shop. This is the same internal energy manifested in a person. That is only who can give Krishna this kind of pleasure. No mortal person can give this kind of pleasure to Krishna. And that person is also created by Krishna. Yeah. Energy, he manifested because he wanted to enjoy. So he created the enjoying potency. And where the pleasure comes from bhakti? Krishna. Krishna. And where he gives this haladini shakti? Where the ability to know Krishna comes from? He gives us Sambhat Shakti. He gives both of these potencies to us as we enter the Bhava Bhakti stage to then be able to experience the bliss and know Him. It all comes from Krishna. Nothing we can do on our own. That again is the humility, the humble position. Prabhuji, like uh, Krishna expects the intimate love of gopis. You're saying, right? He doesn't expect. Oh, he, he, wants. He, 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 he enjoys <laughs> that the most. But let's be clear on one thing before you ask your question. I want to make sure if I mispresented a little bit that Krishna does not expect any. He accepts all worship. The awe and reverence is also pleasing to Krishna. He enjoys that very much. He does not think, oh, this is my lower devotee, this is my higher devotee. 
Does anybody think this is my lesser child and this is my better child? No, Krishna loves all his children. So he doesn't have, and we should not have gradations also. Oh, he is this devotee, I am this. No, that is, that all of that leads to our complete destruction. So Krishna does not expect, nor does he judge, nor does he anchor. But, okay, now I have to explain one thing before your question. I made this comment last time, I'll make it again. You know, and Krishna's Kaviraj Goswami in this fourth chapter explains this. That the rasas, right, from dasya rasa to sakya to vatsalya to madhurya, from servant to friend to parent to lover, there's an intensifying, right, from a servant to a friend, what's a more deeper relation? Friend. But from friend to parent, parental. But from parental to lover, so on an absolute basis, the madhurya rasa is the highest. But as we, if we are situated in one of the rasas, let's say I'm in Sakyaras, to me that's the best. Everything else is left. So no one feels like, oh, I have, I got almost to the top. There's none of that consciousness exists. To, from each person's perspective, they achieve the best that they want. In the Vaikuntha plan, is nobody is thinking, oh, I don't have everything perfect. They have something more. Because if you want something, you get it. So everybody is fully satisfied. There is no... But if we look ex objectively, meaning not from our position, from having that position, whatever we obtain is the best. But objectively, we can see there is a gradation. So that gradation, though, will never lead to dissatisfaction to us. So, sorry, now go ahead and ask your question. So that was my question to you. Since we know that Krishna is the Supreme, and gopis, they were covered with Yoga Maya, but we know... Krishna is supreme and we hear to Krishna Kata. So obviously that respectful love develops. With, uh, the, uh, that friendship, uh, love, all these things doesn't come by Prabhu mm. because we know about Him. So that's what my question is. So you pray to be covered by Yoga Maya. <laughs> all other Mayas covered. No, no, we are <laughs> we, we are covered by Mahamaya. Only one Maya, Yoga Maya is not covered. <laughs> we, we are covered by Mahamaya, but we pray someday that will purify enough that Krishna will bestow his yoga maya potency upon us also and we'll be able to serve in Vrindavan Dham. And that is guaranteed. Srila Prabhupada said, I'm guaranteeing you this if you follow this process. So it'll happen. It will happen. It's just taking longer. Uh, that, how long it takes based on our sincerity, based on how much we put into it. How long it'll take me to make a fit body depends on how much effort I put into it. How much it, how long it takes me to obtain, you know, a certain level of playing any activity? How much I put into it? How long it'll take me to purify like this? How intense is my practice? Just one pro, only one class. Right, pro? Yes. Okay. The yoga maya is bestowed by Krishna to the pure devotee. Once he sees that there is a purity in him, then he will... <laughs> Not only to his devotees, so he to him himself. How can he be bestowed? That's inconceivable. Because in order for him to receive the rasa of Vatsalya rasa, oh. <laughs> he forgets that he is the Supreme Lord. Now that's beyond our comprehension. But he says in the script how Yoga Maya also covers his understanding. But she cannot cover him. How? She, she is a servant, but she does. So because Krishna wants to enjoy this work, his own experience becomes pure when he truly feels the young, naughty child of Mother Yashoda being chastised, which gives him great pleasure. The elderly coward gopis are making him dance for buttermilk. If he thought, wait a minute, I am the source of all Sudabi cows, I am the source mm -hmm. of all Brahmandas, I could get as much buttermilk as I want, I just have to think and it's here. But he is dancing, as they say, to get some buttermilk. Inconceivable. But by Krishna's mercy, it can become understood, as Krishna's Kaviraj Goswami said, right, in the beginning of this. Uh, 
chapter. I read that first verse. It said, By the mercy of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, even a foolish child can fully describe the real nature of Lord Krishna, the enjoyer of the pastimes of Raja, according to the vision of the revealed scriptures. Even a foolish child, by the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, it can happen. So these very difficult to grasp concepts. The goal is just to spark some curiosity, some interest. And in time it will be revealed to all of us. But whatever you're mentioning, that it doesn't have that happens in the spiritual world. In the material world this will happen? Yes. Yoga Maya thing. Not so much the Yoga Maya thing as far as I understand. But the the purity of our service, the spontaneity of our love, this Krishna Prema, I guess, it can manifest in the, in the... There's no difference between Vrindavan in the material world and Vrindavan in the spiritual world. The only difference is what we perceive, but there is no actual difference. None. Zero. Sorry, it's so late. Thank you. Srila Prabhupada ki Yananta Kuti Vaishnava Vrinda ki Gauranga Mahaprabhu ki